Good morning, everyone. Um, so we're going to get started with the first session today that's on doing economics. So first of all, straight over to, to Margaret and Eileen. Okay, so uh, Eileen and I are going to, to introduce um, the, the materials that have been created for doing economics um, and give you sort of some sense of what, uh, um, what we think we're trying to do here. Um, some people maybe have already uh, used them. The, the, the beta version of doing economics is available on the core website. Um, but we want to kind of give you a, a, a sense of how, how you might uh, use this. Um, so what's it about? Well. The idea um, is that uh, uh, we should give students uh, a kind of an, an opportunity to actually get hands-on with, with real data. Um, and I think, I mean, if you've been uh, uh, teaching economics, uh, um, then you'll know that you know, a resource where you can actually give students access to data is hugely valuable, um, but a lot of work um, from, uh, uh, for, the, for, for, the, for the teacher. Um, so hopefully doing economics will give you some off-the-shelf projects which you can uh, use in different contexts and be confident that um, they work. Um, as soon as you get to, to uh, thinking about data handling, then the question arises as, is, is how much students know about statistics, whether they know anything at all about statistics, and whether you can get anywhere without first te teaching them a load of stuff about statistical concepts um, and possibly completely turning them off before you get to the data. So the idea is to, to try to, to, to solve that problem. And what it consists of is a, a, a collection of projects um, where the data and the questions uh, um, are laid out for you. And alongside that, um, there's very practical guidance for students to work through this, either using R or using Excel. And at every point, there's a, an opportunity to, to, um, uh, uh, to choose which of those you want to do, um, to, uh, uh, to be helped through uh, how to apply uh, um, statistical techniques using those tools uh, to try to answer the questions. But the focus throughout is on interesting policy questions. Um, and what we're thinking of here is, is something that can be uh, uh, accessible and useful with a huge number of different kinds of students, not just economic students, uh, certainly not, not just students with uh, um, statistical knowledge, but students who will need for their everyday lives, for, their, for, for all kinds of work in the future, they will need in some way or other. Uh, to be able to, to, to handle data. Um, I was thinking about this recently in the context of I'm a, a governor at my local primary school, and if anyone else has been involved with uh, schools lately, they'll know that collecting data is a massive amount uh, of, of, of the job of teachers now. They are monitored to within an inch of their lives, and every day they have to be collecting data on how their pupils are doing and the school has to be monitoring performance and the people who are required to do this are primary school teachers governors from the community who have really very little um, idea uh, uh, of how to make sense of data but increasingly people whatever their uh, uh, working lives or, 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 or lives in the community are going are, are faced with having to deal uh, with data in one way or another OK, so if we're going to actually enable uh, students to, to use data, then they are going to need some sort of statistical tools. Essentially, they have to have a sense of how much variation there is in the data and how you can draw conclusions despite the fact that uh, 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 there's, a, there's variation in the data. There are no firm answers. There are no single numbers uh, that give you answers. You need a sense of, of what variation in the data means. So the first, uh, 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 I mean, perhaps the primary thing that we're trying to do is simply to take a data set and try to understand what's there uh, and represent it in a way that it makes sense to us uh, um, as, as humans who want to, 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 to get some information out of it. So a big focus on summary measures, um, the, 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 the mean, uh, the standard deviation, the variance, uh, correlation coefficient, all of those things students are calculating and interpreting using the software uh, from the beginning. Of course, they're not calculating these things by hand because you can ask Excel um, to, to calculate a mean straightforwardly, but you do need to have a, a real sense of what that number is telling you. 
Um, so summary measures and ways of uh, representing data in an interesting way in tables and charts. And then the other thing, uh, uh, that the, um, the other part of the focus is what kinds of conclusions can we draw from the data? What kind of uh, uh, questions can we hope to ask given the amount of random variation that we see there. So the kinds of questions that we're uh, um, addressing are, we've got two groups, we want to know whether there's a, a, a real difference between them or not. Um, when we calculate two averages, which are not quite the same, uh, do they tell us that, that, uh, that there is a difference or don't they? Um, do they tell us that some treatment or other has had an effect? Um, when we calculate those numbers, we're interested in the size of the numbers. How big is the effect? Um, and uh, uh, then the other kind of question lying behind this is whether the data, given the way they were collected, um, tell us anything about causation. Um, uh, we might want to be measuring a particular quantity in the data and to ask how precise the measurement is um, of, uh, uh, of, that, of, of, the, of the underlying kind of true value of a quantity. Now we're trying to do all those things in quite an intuitive way um, without getting stuck on, 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 uh, um, on, on the precise details of concepts and, and, and on calculations. Um, and the two tools that we make most use of here are p-values um, and confidence intervals. Now, if you look at the beta version um, of, of uh, doing economics, um, there's also quite a lot of use of um, statistical significance. Um, but there's a new version, um, which Eileen tells, tells me will be available um, at the end of August, is that right? Um, where we have actually now decided to abandon the concept of statistical significance. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm just going to spend a few minutes um, explaining why. Um, some of you might have seen uh, the recent debate which has taken place about this, uh, um, culminating in, a, in an article in Nature in March where uh, more than 800 st scientists and statisticians have called for an end to the use of the terms statistically significant and insignificant. Um, it's just a, a, a short note in Nature and well worth reading because I think it will probably make you think, uh, if you haven't read it, it will make you think about uh, um, how you use um, this idea of, of significance in your own research and how it's affected the kinds of studies that you've done. So just a kind of a, a flavour of the argument um, against using statistical significance. What they're saying is... Uh, it, in fact, this has been perhaps a little bit, I think, misrepresented in some of the debate because people have, have said it's about not using p-values. If you read the article, it's really not about not using p-values. What they're arguing is that p-values should not be used in this dichotomous way where you say um, this is a, is a statistically significant result and this one is not. Um, so if we get a p-value of bigger than 5%, um, we say there's, there's no significant effect. Um, so what's the argument against that? Well, what what I think what they're saying uh, uh, mainly is it's about how we think about and communicate um, about our results. It's the way simply saying no significant effect uh, um, kind of uh, uh, shifts the debate, shifts the way we think about something. And it's actually a shorthand for really quite a complex idea. What does, uh, what, what does this actually mean when we see a p-value bigger than 5%? It means there's variation in the data, so we can't be sure that we've got an effect. And then that there's a probability that's higher than 5%, we actually don't know what, uh, uh, what it is, but that's higher than 5% that, we could have, that the thing that we've observed um, could have arisen by chance. Um, that's, I mean, that, 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 that statement takes some getting hold of, um, and it certainly does, does for students. And if we go straight to no significant effect, you know, in, automatically one uh, uh, um, is, is kind of drawn towards the sort of, um, the, the, uh, uh, the, the, almost the certainty um, that you get in that statement um, and away from um, the complexity of what the data are telling you. So it's really a communication problem. They say it's a, a human and cognitive um, problem, not a statistical problem. 
Um, and it can lead to quite dangerous outcomes. I mean, simply saying, for example, that a drug has no significant side effects um, might be a, a very worrying conclusion to draw um, from a, a data set. And then uh, um, there, there's quite a lot of discussion um, about how this leads to a bias in the literature, certainly uh, uh, in, in, in economics as well as uh, other parts of the academic literature, uh, which focuses on data, where, the, uh, where, where researchers and editors are uh, um, influenced hugely by whether there are enough stars on the, uh, on, on the numbers or not. So here's a, um, an example. Um, just of, of, uh, of a particular study, um, this is actually uh, um, a study which was, this is, this is from real data, uh, and it was uh, um, trying to understand whether um, there was a significant uh, difference in outcomes um, between uh, disadvantaged groups that are labelled here um, with different colours uh, compared to a baseline group. And those are the numbers and the sort of uh, that come out of a, of a regression. There were quite a lot of controls in the regression. Um, and uh, we look at that and say, well, um, two of the groups um, had a sig sig uh, 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 statistically significant difference um, from the baseline white group, um, and the others didn't. Um, so that's pretty much, when we look at that kind of table, that's what we, how we, we tend to sort of draw conclusions from it. The, the blue and the green group, uh, they had significantly worse outcomes than the white group, and the other groups were not significantly different. Now, uh, the, two, the two stars here um, indicate um, a 1% um, a, uh, level, and uh, uh, none of the others were significant at the 5% level. Supposing we can't put stars on things, and we actually have to look at the data, look at the results that we're getting. So you could look at, 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 at perhaps the coefficients themselves, um, the p-values corresponding to them, but also relevant here is the group size. Um, the baseline group here was a large group, and each of these kind of minority groups, these possibly disadvantaged groups, were really quite small numbers uh, of individuals. And that's quite relevant when we start to think about uh, uh, what we draw from this uh, uh, um, this table of, of information. Um, if you look at the p-values, okay, only two of them are very small, but all the others are quite small. Um, so maybe the first thing um, that, we would, that we might conclude uh, would be to say that all of these minority groups had lower outcomes um, than the white group. They're all negative, um, and they all have relatively small p-values. And already that's kind of changing um, the kind of the way that we think about the data. And then we could look at the size of the coefficients. Um, the blue group is a small group, um, but its effect is very large. Uh, uh, the coefficient of, of minus 0.83 compared with all the rest, it seems to be, have a big difference from the white group, and it has a very low p-value. It's, uh, it's only a small group. In fact, it's, the, it's, almost, it's, it's one of the two smallest groups, um, but the p-value is very low. So we can have a lot of confidence that this group um, had very much worse outcomes uh, than the white group. Um, then if we look at, uh, for instance, this one here, um, the yellow group, um, what, do the, what, do, what do those results suggest? Well, they suggest that the, there, was a, there was rather small effect, um, but the p-value is 11%, um, which uh, um, certainly is suggestive um, that actually, although the effect was small, it was a real effect in that case. This is quite a large group. The effect is only small. Um, so the p-value um, of 11% uh, um, seems uh, one that we should take seriously. And then if we look at all the other groups, actually all the effects are about the same size. Um, they're all around um, minus 0.2. Um, and whether they have a low p-value or not really seems to be related mainly to the size of the group. Um, so if we take um, the green group, um, which was the largest of those ones with the effect value, but the effect around minus 0.2, um, then that um, has uh, um, a p-value uh, of 0 0.003. So we could probably have a lot of confidence in that one. Um, but then we, the, other, the other groups that have quite similar, uh, um, uh, similar effect sizes, um, the p-values simply get a bit larger as the size of the group 
um, gets rather gets a bit smaller. And even at the, uh, uh, the smallest group here, the orange group, um, we have a p-value of only 30%. So you get the idea. We look, we look seriously at the results and we try to um, interpret them um, rather than giving students just a, a switch that says yes or no um, to uh, statistical significant, significance. And this is not just about, um, uh, uh, about uh, teaching. Since I started thinking this way, I think I, I, I read research papers and think about my own work in a rather different way as well. Um, so how do we do this? How do we teach p-values um, in, uh, in doing economics? Um, this is just a, um, a quote from the, uh, uh, from, from the new version. Um, the p-value is calculated by comparing the difference in the means of two sets of data, which is the, the, the thing that we're concentrating on when p-value is first uh, introduced, with the standard deviations of the data. And those are some concepts that the students have already... <coughs> Uh, uh, used um, uh, uh, over and over before they get to this point in the, in the two sets. And it tells us the probability that the difference could have happened simply by chance. The smaller the p-value, the less likely that we, we would, would observe these differences by chance. And whether the statistical evidence is strong enough for us to draw a conclusion about the data will just always be a matter of judgment. You need to apply judgment uh, to look at the results and think about the context of the study. Are we talking about the side effects of drugs? Are we talking about uh, disadvantaged groups? Um, what are our uh, um, initial uh, um, ideas about what we might expect to find? Think about the context, use judgment um, in interpreting uh, 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 the results that we get. We don't tell students how to calculate p-values. They can go and, uh, they can go and uh, uh, get um, the software to do that for them. Um, but there are plenty of opportunities in doing economics to think about what those numbers uh, that they get um, out, of the, uh, 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 out of the software are telling them. Um, so what we're doing here is trying to move in doing economics, in, in taking this decision, instead of asking is the difference in mean statistically significant, what we're doing is to say, what do the p-values tell us about uh, the numbers that we've obtained, about the difference in means? And in particular, the, the sort of statistical concept is this idea of how likely that we could have just got those results um, by chance. And we're using that in many different contexts um, to try to get students to have an intuitive sense of what it means. So Eileen's going to give you a bit more some, some more concrete examples. Yep, so I'm going to show an example here. This is um, in project two. So this is where we introduce um, the concept of p-values. Um, so this, uh, we have an exam score here and then house size, so like number of bedrooms. So these are like the two groups um, here. So there's three things that we want to teach the students. So firstly, we want them to look at how likely it is that the differences occur by chance. So Margaret has already gone over that. Um, but also looking at the size of the difference and like the absolute. Um, so like the economic significance rather than just the statistical significance is also important. So you can see here that there's like a big difference between the groups, um, which may have happened by chance. And then there's a small difference here that might not have happened by chance because students might confuse the two things and saying like, oh, if the effect size is really big, then there's a really high, that's statistically significant. And they're, they're actually two different things. So we want to separate those things out. And also it's about learning about the correlation between two things and not necessarily causation. So in this, uh, in this example here, it's not like adding an extra bedroom will make you smarter, for example. There might be some you know, confounding variables. Um, so, right. so I'm just going to give uh, an overview of the general approach in doing economics and um, a few examples of the things that the projects. So here's a list of all the projects and topics. So there are 12 of them. So for those of you who are familiar with our ebook ESPP, so each project corresponds to one unit there. So like uh, the topics in the units, but you can do them either like a, a standalone project or you can do it to accompany the units in the book. So these slides will be available later, so we'll just skip over that. Um, 
Okay, so the general approach is to focus on intuitive questions. So here are some examples of the questions that we um, are exploring in the project. So in project one, we're in climate change, for example. It's like, how can we tell whether climate change is actually happening or not? Um, and then if it is real, how can we measure the extent of climate change and determine what is causing it? So we're getting to things like correlation versus causation. Um, when, the, when there's like a real physical explanation from, between the two variables that students can um, link to. Um, and also, like for this one, we're just students will download like temperature data and then plot line and line charts over time. Um, and then this one is uh, for, for project two. We have public goods experiments um, with and without punishment. So we all played a public goods experiment yesterday. Um, so we also get students to play the game themselves. So they generate the data by themselves, and so they know roughly like you know how data is created. And then they download the data, and then they can make line charts of their own contributions and things like that. Um, and then we have actual data from a, a public goods experiment that was done um, and cited in a paper yesterday. Um, then they ask, we ask, like, were there any differences in behavior between the experiments? Um, and then can we attribute the observed differences to the change in experimental um, conditions rather than to chance? So this is where we get to p-values. <coughs> right, so the second thing which Margaret has briefly touched on is that uh, student, we just students have to learn about dealing with random variation in the data. So the exercise that we walk them through is like, why might we see differences in behavior that are due to chance? So even, so we get them to sort of like flip a coin and record the outcomes and then like repeat the exercise under the same conditions, so using the same coin, so they're probably going to find that they're not going to get the same sequence of outcomes or the number of heads. So this is just to get them, get it into their head that the important point um, is when you conduct experiments even with the same people under the same conditions, there's like a little bit of randomness, so you won't get exactly the same result every time you do the experiment. So. So we explain statistical concepts in a very intuitive way. So the projects are aimed at people who have GCSE math at grade C. Um, so that's the minimum uh, requirement to enter a UK university. So basically these people may not have seen like graphs or numbers since they were 16. And so they might not be very familiar, they might not be, they might be, they might be very scared of formulas and they don't want to see them. So we don't show them, we try to show them as little mathematical formulas as possible and focusing on the intuition rather than the formula itself. So for example, um, like the, when we introduce the mean, we don't immediately present them with the formula where you, you know, add everything up and divide it by the sum. Because um, some students can focus on that without really thinking about what the mean means. Um, so for the mean, I think we explain it in the like, you know, everybody, like for income, like everybody just gets everything they earn and they put it into a pile and they kind of share it equally among everybody. So that's kind of how we explain it rather than it's the sum of everything divided by the number of people. Um, yeah, so here's an example of how we uh, introduce the variance, and it shows that we closely link it to the use, how, uh, the use of statistical software and interpretation of output. So not just what is the concept, but how would you actually practically implement it in the software, and when you put it, like when you put commands through the software and it spits out something, how do you interpret it? So here um, we tell the students for Excel like what they're supposed to type in, and then also like what the formula does, and then we um, have some examples to show how they can interpret it. Okay, so we want the projects to emphasize, so we emphasize practical implementation. So like how would you use statistical software to answer the questions? Um, and also like how to interpret the software's output, which, uh, and then finally, um, we have a non-technical explanation of how the software works. So it's suitable for people who don't have any or very little knowledge of Excel and like who have no knowledge of like programming languages um, in R. And I also want to add that um, in the newest version that's coming out at the end of August, we're going to have another version to do with Google Sheets. So because Google Sheets is, um, you wouldn't have these issues with Excel where, you know, different versions like Windows and Mac, they're, it's slightly different when you're teaching. And also for Google Sheets, uh, students can work together because it's all in a, as long as they have a Gmail account, they can collaborate. Um, all the commands are the same and we're having new walkthroughs that, um, teach the students how to do things in Google Sheets because you know a lot of research is collaborative and we want students to learn how to collaborate as well. Um, so here are some examples of the guidance we give to students. So there's uh, videos, uh, video walkthroughs. So, um, so here's an example of an Excel walkthrough. These are all on YouTube um, of how to make a frequency table. So there's an example and someone will talk you through it and there's like, you know, a, um, 
it's like a screen grab where you can see what's going on. Uh, and then here's a video we have about how to install R in R Studio, just to emphasize that this is for complete beginners. So some people may never have seen R before. Uh, we have a walkthrough video where um, Ralph Becker from Manchester, he just talks the users through the interface. So like when you first open the program, you're like, oh, what is this? Um, and he teaches, he shows you like, oh, which where you enter the commands in and what the files look like. Um, Okay, so here are some examples. So we have some static walkthroughs as well that are not just not videos. Um, so if you're familiar with the economy or ESPP, you know we have these slide lines where we have diagrams and we add things, like add lines and make the curves move. So there's a bit of that um, for Excel. Uh, we have annotated screenshots. So this is what the user will probably see. And then we have arrows that say, oh, click here, type this in, um, press enter. Um, and then a general like instructions here. And then for R, we have similar things. We have annotated code lines. So here is how you how you can draw a graph that looks similar to the thing that's in the ebook. Um, and then we also have some explanation of what the code is like. Um, right. So that's it for me. Um, there's just a lot of resources out there. Um, yeah, so I encourage you to check it out. Um, oops. Okay. <laughs> Great. So that was me. <laughs> Great, thank you so so much, both of you. That's so interesting. Um, next up is Guillermo. Thank you so much. Uh, fantastic. Uh, I've been asked to. Uh, share with you my experience about uh, using and doing uh, uh, economics. Uh, um, and I do this in a first year module that I've been running for a number of years. Uh, in, a, in its first incarnation, the module was called uh, Spreadsheets and Data in, in Economics. Uh, then we realized that uh, that was scaring students quite a lot. And then we relabeled it Economics in Action, uh, which uh, looks much uh, much cooler and so on. When uh, doing economics then uh, came along, uh, that was, was a great opportunity for me to stop uh, always searching for new data and fresh data and, and so on. And doing economics had some beautiful data sets as I explained just before that could be used. So what I wanted to do is just to show to you a little bit uh, what kind of use I made of uh, uh, the resources that uh, doing economics makes available. Now the first thing I wanted to do is to apologize for the graphics that you're going to see uh, coming next. Uh, I tried to be creative, but I think I've been a little bit too much, uh, possibly. Uh, so first of all, a little bit about uh, about the module. The module is a first year module called Economics in Action. It's first year, first semester. It runs uh, for economics students. Uh, and originally the module was designed uh, to help students uh, come to terms with uh, basically descriptive statistics and reacquaint them with the uh, ideas of uh, computing the city statistics, interpreting, interpreting them, making sense of them, and so on. Students in the second semester then take a, a proper statistical methods module. And so this module is a kind of a, a, a gentle introduction to students' statistical uh, analysis. Uh, what, what you see on the screen is a little bit what the, the module does. So, so the, the module starts very much with um, the idea of uh, collection, collecting data. Um, uh, organizing the data in contingency tables, uh, frequency tables, uh, look at the distributions, uh, uh, measure central tendency ranking uh, uh, correlations by variate analysis. We look at index numbers, we look at measures of um, uh, inequalities as well. And then we finish off uh, by relating distributions uh, to probability. Uh, analysis and probability theory as well. Everything is done in Excel. We don't have lectures for this module. We have two hours uh, uh, class, one hour in a computer lab where we go with students uh, through Excel. And then we have uh, another hour where we, where we uh, talk about uh, how to interpret the data, how to create a narrative from the data that uh, we um, look at and from the statistics that we compute. So in other words, Try to create a, a, a try to give students an, an understanding of how you can interpret information within the context of uh, the issue that uh, you are actually investigating. And that's something that students find extremely difficult. They are very good at telling you that, oh, look, yeah, the mean is 5.2. 
Uh, and then they say, yeah, okay, so that, what does that actually mean? And then for them, it's quite difficult to make sense of that. So what we do is spend quite a lot of time trying to build that narrative. And uh, the resources that the Doing Economics makes available, to some extent, to provide that context uh, through which then the narrative uh, can quite easily be uh, developed. So what I wanted to do is show to you three uses that I have been made in the past uh, of uh, uh, in, uh, the doing uh, in economics resources. The first one is uh, as part of uh, the assessment. So um, I use the measuring climate change uh, task from doing economics uh, to, to assess the students, in particular with respect to group presentation. Now, uh, in, in my module, I use problem-based learning uh, for students' learning. So, so basically, ap apart from going uh, through Excel and explaining uh, how the various statistics uh, uh, can be computed in Excel, then what I do is I simply give students the data set and I say, well, what we want to do here, here is really to investigate uh, climate change, whether that is actually happening or not. And what I want you to do is to prepare a presentation that uh, uses the data in order to make an argument about whether climate change actually happens or not. So, so then the students go away and then they work on, on their presentation, they come back to me, I give them a little bit of uh, feedback on uh, how they are progressing and then they eventually present uh, to the rest of the class and then there is a discussion in class uh, as well. And so what, what, uh, uh, the, the aim of the, of the, the assessment is very much uh, apart from me the skills of presentation skills, uh, delivering uh, uh, information, complex information and so on, is very much about uh, uh, producing uh, descriptive statistics, uh, what, what is the, the mean of uh, the, uh, the temperatures deviations, what is the median, what is um, the mode, what is this telling us about uh, the, the distribution of, uh, of the data. So there's a lot of interpretation that they really need uh, to, to do. And uh, uh, then we talk about, uh, the, uh, they have to produce distributions, so they look at correlations between um, the uh, deviations of temperatures with uh, uh, CO2 emissions, and then uh, they have to talk about uh, these, whether there is a correlation, line of best fit and interpretation of uh, this. So there is quite, quite a lot of uh, work involved into it. And uh, one of the things uh, that I add on top of what uh, doing economics uh, does is to ask uh, students also to present uh, their information in terms of density distributions. Uh, and then I link this up uh, with a probability analysis. So I tell them, oh, what, what was the probability that in uh, the 60s and 70s, uh, the, the temperatures deviations was uh, between 0 0.5 and 1, per, uh, and 1 uh, degree Celsius. And what is the same probability in the 1980s or 90s and, and so on. For me, Dana, that is a link to, to go into statistical analysis. So I, I try to make sure to them how we look at, uh, compute, uh, and investigate density distributions. Uh, and then that is something that I continue with them in the statistical methods module in the second semester. So the students find that the task is extremely engaging, even if uh, I use the problem-based learning where they have to go away and they have to grapple with the issue themselves. The fact that it's a topical issue uh, is an issue that raises curiosity. Uh, it really leads uh, them uh, into uh, trying to investigate well beyond what I'm actually asking them uh, to do. So some groups in their presentations came up explaining very carefully why the CO2 measurements uh, carried out in the highway and uh, uh, mountains uh, is very accurate and precise and so on. So they, they really get into, into it uh, beyond just uh, the the statistical analysis. So students have found, found the task extremely, extremely interesting, extremely rewarding, and then, and then it's an easy and uh, um, engaging way for them to learn about, uh, about statistics. So that's one, one assessment. Another thing that I did, uh, this was last year, I used the sugar tax uh, project uh, on uh, doing economics, really to uh, give uh, a, a project to the students. So basically what I told the students at the beginning of the semester is that uh, there is uh, this data set about uh, this uh, sugar project, there is this article uh, about uh, this, this project. What I want you to do is to replicate uh, the results of uh, this article. I'm not asking them to do the statistical analysis in terms of hypothesis testing, p-values and so on because it's beyond uh, what the module intends to achieve. So that is something that we look later on in the statistical methods module in the second semester. So what I really ask here to do, the students is really 
to engage in uh, project, uh, in project development and project writing. And that's the kind of skills that I want them to develop on top of uh, these statistical tools and these statistical uh, analysis. So what I, what I ask the students to do is in the first step to produce a literature review about uh, what uh, research has been carried out there about the effects of sugar tax. And then I ask them, okay, so collect uh, or pick up this data that the doing economics makes available and then uh, make an argument of whether the sugar tax introduced in California actually works or not. And so again, so the students have these data, so they need to organize the data, use pivot tables to create contingency and frequency tables, look at distributions, produce line graphs over time. And uh, in terms of the objective of, of the task, they, they, they really develop a great skills in terms of uh, report writing, interpretation of statistics, making sense of statistics, put the statistics into context. And uh, what uh, emerged uh, from the investigation is that uh, many students uh, tended to be quite critical about uh, whether they believed that the effects of the tax was really uh, um, uh, positive or, or non-positive at all. And uh, so there was quite a lot of discussion that actually emerged uh, from uh, the work that each group uh, ca carried out. So again, I, I, I carried out um, or I set up this project as a, as a problem-based learning again. So I really gave just the project to the students. They were working on the project on their own, coming back to me. I was giving them feedback, and then they were going on uh, until the completion of uh, the project. And uh, finally, um, uh, one other use I make of uh, the, uh, the doing economics uh, uh, resources is about uh, uh, practicing in particular, uh, as I told you earlier, for this module we have one, um, one hour a week uh, that we spend in the computer lab. And uh, I find the credit, the credit excluded households data set extremely powerful to kick start with them the discussion about data and data analysis and data management in economics. Because uh, the, um, the credit excluded households has a large survey data. And so with the students, we start discussing about, OK, so is this, uh, is this data population data or is uh, uh, sample data? Uh, why is it sample? Why is it population? Uh, then uh, what are we computing here? Are we computing statistics or are we computing parameters uh, here? OK, so if you are computing uh, uh, statistics, uh, what kind of statistics uh, do we want to look at? And then also look at the data set. What kind of data do we have here? Oh, this is quantitative data. This is qualitative data. OK, so this qualitative data can be codified into quantitative data. Okay, so how do we do it? And so, on. so, so you can start uh, building a fantastic uh, uh, discourse on how data is, uh, is collected, is presented, and that can be manipulated, and then how the data then can be used uh, to carry out various investigations. So I, I use it uh, to show, again, st students uh, uh, different types of, uh, types of data, how you can codify the data, uh, use pivot table, contingency tables, and so on. And uh, in particular in Excel, students are find difficult to cope with contingency or with pivot tables in general. I don't know whether you have had the same experience, but the, the idea of uh, organizing data uh, in a table through pivot table is some, something that some students really struggle with. So that's, this task is quite helpful in order to do that. What this task also uh, is, or, or what this resource also is very useful for, is uh, to tell, to start the students to think about uh, research questions. So to say, oh, look at, look at this big data set. What is interesting to investigate from this data set? What kind of research question would you investigate? Oh, yeah, I would like to see whether it's uh, women that are more credit constrained than men. OK, so let's do it. How would you do it? And so, so you can start uh, pushing students into thinking about uh, carrying out uh, research right early from early in the, in the semester. And then, of course, that you develop this over the semester. And so, on. And so this resource is quite fantastic in, in this respect. Anyway, so that's, that's everything. I apologize again for the graphics. Uh, that's uh, my, my, my sharing of my uh, experience. They're beautiful. What are you talking about? <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm, I started having color flashes in my eyes <laughs> yesterday while I was doing it. And I said, so, so. <laughs> so thank you so much. Thanks so much.
Okay, so over to Dunley. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. So today, uh, basically, it's kind of a continuous discussion of what I uh, uh, explained yesterday. So it's still about the module, an introduction to applied economics. But today, I'm going to share my experience about using uh, this uh, uh, doing economics uh, module uh, uh, book, okay? So uh, this doing economics, so I used the uh, uh, select project from that book as this uh, part of our uh, 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 assignment, so basically students as I mentioned yesterday, basically they expect to do some uh, uh, tasks every week. So, oh, uh, sorry, I think the, there's some problem with the, the first sentence, okay? Um, so because, as, uh, as Aileen just explained, actually because the solutions and the walkthroughs have been provided, so students have access to the detailed this walkthrough and how to do this each project. So in the assignment, basically what students will do is that they, they will look at the walkthrough, they will look at the solution and follow them. However, when they do the, their own work, they need to choose different time period or use different examples. So this, I just show you the example for the, uh, the first project, climate change. So basically this is the instruction that I gave to the students saying the, uh, this, the, uh, the part in red basically means that they really need to basically do something different from the, what's being provided uh, in the, this ebook. So overall that, the experience, basically the students, the, ex uh, uh, the experience of using this uh, doing economics, this um, imperial project, overall quite positive. They really appreciate the Excel skill they, they have learned. They feel they are very useful and, um, and also they particularly praise the doing economic part is really good. So it's quite uh, positive. However, because we also need to talk about the challenges, however, there are indeed some challenges when we're doing this, uh, this part, this uh, doing economic part. The first one is about, Aileen actually mentioned before that because different students might use the different computers with, with different systems or with different, uh, this Excel project. So they find some difficulties to follow the, the solutions or follow the walkthroughs. So the, um, this quotation mark basically, basically is the student is feedback in the uh, self-evaluation survey. They basically, they, they feel, sometimes they feel challenging to basically to follow these uh, um, walkthroughs. And then the other challenge is about the uh, group project because, uh, for example, for the, the second, this um, project about the public good games, means students need to work in groups. Because, as I mentioned yesterday, one of the challenges is the students they come from different uh, departments, so it means that actually they seldom encounter each other. So it means in terms of doing the group project, so they find it particularly challenging to basically to find these uh, members to, to do this uh, group project. So this is the... Uh, um, some issue they also affect up. So um, another thing is about assessment, um, because currently I ask students to do this uh, improve project as a homework, and they just uh, uh, homework, they do not count for the final uh, grade. So this involves some incentive problem. Basically students consider this basically demotivate them from spending a lot of time to do the uh, Excel project. So again, that uh, the quote is come from the student, this uh, feedback. So what I'm going to do, so given the feedback I received from students, what I'm going to do um, for next year will be that <coughs> um, I will introduce an Excel project. Actually, this kind of linked to the, uh, the core, this, um, this doing economics over uh, this data, this competition, actually kind of linked to that one. So it means that I will give students some incentive to really spend time and effort to it, means this one will eventually count uh, for 10% of final grade, and then, um, so basically what they need to do is they need to identify an economic topic which basically related to the unit taught in the first half of the, uh, uh, of the term. So it means that we already covered the climate change, uh, covered inequality, those kind of very important issues. And then they need to use at least this one data set from this doing economics and then use, um, use Excel to, to do the data analysis. And then, of course, uh, because this eventually will be uh, assessed, so they cannot just simply replicate the project from the, from the book. And eventually, they need to um, submit uh, 800 this word report. So this is the, what I'm going to do next year. And again, this, in light of this, uh, this change, and also this uh, tutorial arrangement will be changed accordingly. So what I'm thinking is that for the next year, so basically well, one tutorial, 
prefer, uh, prefer in the second half term will be dedicated basically to talk about the Excel this project. So before the students come to the this tutorial, they already should have some ideas rega regarding what topic they are going to explore and what uh, this um data they're going to use. And then in the tutorial, basically they are working in the groups. Basically they try to learn from the, what we call this a peer discussion, try to learn from the peer. And then in that case, the tutor basically serve as like a facilitator. So this, um, this is what I'm going to do for, for next year. And then because this is the, um, basically the only one, only four uh, tutorial in total. So for the next three tutorials, basically many folks on the, this the typical, this traditional exam type questions. So this is what uh, I'm gonna propose. And as I said, eventually this, uh, hopefully, hopefully we still have this uh, data competition, this core this uh, next year. So this will be linked to that one. I will encourage students basically to submit the work to the, to the competition. So this is briefly uh, my experience. And then if you have questions, feel free to basically to, to raise it. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks so much to all the presenters. Um, so we've, we've plenty of time for discussion this morning. So do we have any questions? Uh, I don't think this actually works. <laughs> No, that's okay. This is for you to record, so please use it. Okay. Um, uh, I'd like to ask a question to Giuliano about, um, well, the more practicalities of doing, s the, well, implementing uh, your approach. Uh, I think you didn't mention the size of the class. I mean, f because a lot of the work is uh, focused on students and practicing and working in groups. How large are the classes and was that a problem? How do you do it? So more practical. Yeah. Um, oh. yeah in, in, the pa in the past, we used to have lectures, so two hours lecture and one hour uh, class, so where the classes were uh, of 20 students. So then uh, I quickly realized that to teach students in a lecture how to compute uh, a, a variance or a standard deviation was a, a killer, and people would disappear very quickly. And so so we, sw we, we changed the module to two hours of contact time each week in small groups. Uh, of 20. So I meet each group uh, for the first hour uh, in the computer lab, we do Excel work. Uh, and then the second hour, again, still in the same uh, small group, uh, we go through, in particular, interpretation, analysis, writing, uh, narrative about uh, the, the statistics that we compute. So we, uh, we have about 200 students on, on this module. So we have about uh, 10 groups. Uh, and uh, uh, I take charge of some groups, and then I have it, uh, some TAs that help me out with the other groups instead. Any other questions? Hi. Um, at LSE, um, I'm aware of your wonderful resources because we encourage students to do the uh, competition this year. So I have two questions on that for economic specialists who already have statistics, because it's such a wonderful resource on how to start doing research. Things like, what do you do with missing data, which we often don't tell students about. Um, but I had a barrier, and I wonder if we could design, I could try to do this. Um, a, if you already know this, go to f quickly. Um, kind of diagram because the barrier was that students got impatient if they already knew it, um, some of the material, like R. Uh, it's absolutely a wonderful resource that should be recommended to everybody for the walkthroughs. I think we should adopt it for everything. Um, but I'd like to see it spread also to the kind of people who'll be like you and start teaching it as well. Uh, become GT, you know, graduate teaching assistants and be enthusiastic about using it. Um, so I, and, and it is designed so that you can, it's really a great course, but you need to be, I think, led through it or told to jump. And I can identify a few of the places where students got bogged down just because they were impatient. They shouldn't be, but they were. Um, I do, um, and I, uh, I'm not going to get into the discussion on statistical significance, but I think we also need to carry that into a discussion that we involve everyone in, because it's more challenging as a paradigm shift than anything 
that was discussed yesterday. Um, and it will, it will challenge all of economics. So it's important that we, and students are going to find that halfway through, you know, we're talking about people graduating, that we're shaking their foundations. I haven't seen anything like it since I saw my Russian colleagues when the Soviet Union collapsed. <laughs> and, and it caused a crisis. People talked about it as a professional crisis. And so we need to address it as that. Uh, because we have been thinking that way. So um, I, really, um, I really want to see this uh, start in, uh, spread further. And I, would, um, and I think it can be done by uh, that kind of guidance on you can go, if you already know A, then go already to E, uh, basically. Um, thanks very much for that. Oh, and also, is it possible to think about changing the date of the essay? Uh, uh, because it really is, as, as with the RAS video, when we, a year ago, there were almost no submissions because it's, um, it comes at the wrong time for students who are exam focused. And so a shift in it could involve more people. For example, using their summer better simply by making a, July, an, a late July deadline. I'm sure I would have had uh, 20 more submissions uh, maybe more if it could have been a late July de deadline. Many students started and then stopped because at some point the alarm bell went on about exams, as you all know. Okay. Could, maybe we just very briefly need to explain about the competition. I mean, about the data competition. People don't know about it. Yeah, so we had a data, this is the first year that we had a data competition, and essentially, um, we prompted students to, it was aimed at undergraduate students, um, and we prompted them to look at the projects and doing economics and like uh, address, like think of an important policy issue related to climate change, inequality, or well being. And there was a lot of data sets in doing economics that they could use um, in addition to any supplementary data sets uh, that they wanted to do, uh, that they wanted to use in order to explore this policy issue. And then so they were supposed to create some sort of like policy report and make some recommendations. So it was around like a 10 page policy report. Uh, we did advertise it through the email channels. Um, and the prizes were quite substantial. So it's like a 750 pound Amazon voucher and a 500 pound um, Amazon voucher. And they can do it in, it's for two categories, XL and R. So there's like four prizes total. Um, so the deadline was uh, May 15th. Um, well, we chose it because we thought that after that, the students would be too focused on doing exams anyway. Uh, but I think we may have even set that too late. Um, yeah, but we did have around 20 submissions. So it wasn't, it wasn't that bad. Um, yeah. There's, a, there's another question. Could I just um, pick up that um, on, on the question of, of significance and using it or not? Um, it's, it's it's really hard not not to use the word. I mean, we're kind of uh, uh, um, we, we, we're very heavily trained to do that. Um, I think it's also it's important that we don't pretend to students that this concept doesn't exist because they're going to see it. I mean, even in the papers that are, that are referred to in um, doing economics, the, the word appears. So we need to 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 uh, you know be open about that. This is not the way. We think it's best to interpret the data, but people do it, and this is why they do it and how they do it. So it, it's it's not completely ignored in doing economics. It, it does get mentioned at various points so that we can be kind of straight about what we're doing. Yeah, yeah I think on, on the especially because there's still also a movement to get rid of p-values. And actually, I could recommend something that's student readable, which is in the American Statistician, which says p-values are innocent. It's the people who are misusing it that are wrong. And it fits very much with what you're saying. And it's that kind of, um, uh, I think VoxEU also has uh, good uh, articles that are accessible to everyone to read quickly yeah. to get the idea of exactly what you're getting across about the, the shift, that it isn't throwing out everything. Right. Um, it's uh, ending the misinterpretation. Yeah. Okay, thank you for the, <clears throat> for the nice presentations. I have a, a little bit of a, a, a question I was asking myself when you said, okay, we were kind of hiding in a way the, the formulas. Uh, of the mean or so, in order that uh, people can kind of have a more intuitive understanding of this and being drawn into it and not repelled by kind of some formulas. But um, my question is whether this 
book should not also be about kind of leading people into algorithmic thinking because I mean this is what you will need later on and kind of this translation from a data matrix to a to a statistic, whatever of whatever form, is, is a form of algorithmic thinking that I think is very important to kind of uh, convey over the time. So not only the result, but the process which kind of generates this result, which is kind of a special type of thinking that I think we should encourage because this is what a, a, I think a good economist should be able to do. So the question is kind of should one encourage this type of, of teaching? Or shall I, shall I, <laughs> shall I try, try going first? Um, I mean, what, of course, there's nothing to stop you using these resources in teaching and supplementing them um, with kind of more formal uh, uh, um, uh, uh, additions, formulae, uh, making things more precise in a kind of more mathematical way. Um, I think it's not really a question about of, of, of hiding things, though, um, more about the language we use to communicate them. So for, for, for some people, just seeing a formula which just says the, you know, the sum of xi over n, that's really alienating. But they're perfectly capable of understanding the concept of a mean. And it's to do with the, the language that we, we use to, to uh, um, explain that concept. Um, so if, you, if your students are, are happy with using the, the formal language or, or if you want to train them to do that, then that's fine. But um, it's not essential. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I wanted to just kind of uh, make the point that, I mean, I see this, but is, isn't it part of us as educators as well to kind of lead people from the intuitive way as a first access to the more formal way? Because this is kind of the, the transition that they, that they have to go through in order to be an economist uh, in a way... In, in a sense, a, a well-trained economist uh, that kind of can then use some form of mathematical logic, what it is, in order to, to, to make their arguments. So kind of, and this, this transition, I think we should facilitate. And this is not, not, re not repelling them, but kind of taking them and kind of take those people who are afraid of it and then go on and, and kind of lead them to this. And this would be actually a nice outcome. Maybe I, can I can I step in? Uh, no, I, I agree with you. I think to some extent uh, maybe we, we can have a discourse or a, a debate on whom are we targeting. Uh, if, it, if it is the kind of the, the, the social science general students and so on, it, maybe we can ask ourselves: Do we really need uh, to to show them what what lies behind all that kind of algorithmic process? I, I'm, I don't have a point of view. I mean, I think it's just to have a debate about it. I think as far as uh, studying uh, as, as teaching econ economic students, yeah, I, I think I. I agree with you, probably we need to do that, in particular if students are then later on going to more st formal statistical modules and so on. But I think to some extent, uh, the fact that the students are invited to use, for example, Excel, triggers that kind of thinking straight away because you say, oh, there is a var dot p and a var dot s function. So, mm, what's that? Why two functions? So what is the difference? Between? And then you can start having a discourse with the students about, yeah, there is a difference behind that and, and so on. So I, I think, uh, yeah, I think two issues. One, whom are you targeting as a student? Secondly, if it is stu economic students, I think uh, the tasks and uh, the software kind of automatically triggers some discussion about it, I think, at least from my experience. <laughs> explanation of the concept and then basically students really get the idea but you, they also need to doing it they also need to implement it then the Excel is simply used as a tool basically to implement the idea and I think eventually when they get results they also need to know how to interpret it, how to understand it so I think in terms of algorithm mining I think this one eventually is kind of part of it because when they implement when they're doing economics they need to understand it before they're doing that mm -hmm. Can I just say one thing, um, that even for students who are at my institution uh, studying economics, uh, who are doing highly formal courses in statistics, they cannot do these exercises. So uh, I think, yeah, exactly, exactly, absolutely. And I think that, that there is really a case for, uh, for doing 
in a, in a way Guglielmo's approach, which is starting off to pique their curiosity in the data to uh, begin to ask questions, to have tools, as Dunley said, to, uh, to, to give them ways of representing the data. And then the real challenge, and uh, I, it's a challenge to everyone here, is to think about that transitional course that would take them from this curiosity about data and beginning to formulate research questions to, uh, to, the, to the formalization. And at the moment, they're just two completely different worlds. And many of the students, I would say, uh, of even my students, uh, are, are completely unable to join up those two pieces. I think we have time for one more question, if anyone else has a question. So more than a question, I, I have a, a, a clarification. So is it possible to feed new data to all these exercises? So if I have a completely different data set, and, uh, so can I use the exercise and plug this new data and still run the, the whole exercise, so the, the, the whole activity? Um. Well, uh, maybe Eileen is the best person to, to, to yeah. answer that. So I think, so I mean, the walkthroughs are f fairly general. So things like calculating the mean and the variance can be applied to any, any sort of data set. Um, of course, the solutions wouldn't apply if you were using different data. But I think that a lot of the tasks can be applied to like similar data sets. Um, yeah. You, you probably need to do a little bit of work either to get your, yeah. your, 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 your data set in a identical format yeah. to the one yeah. that's there or to give the students a, a sense of, of, of what the differences is, are and, and, and how to, you know, um, you may, maybe do some, repeat some of the things that are done in doing economics in your own materials. Um, yeah. Yeah, because what I was thinking is, 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 is a fairly easy way to update all these results is that if, if yeah. people have new data and they can plug it and they can put it either in the, in the labs or somewhere else where you would have different variations of exactly the same, yes. the yeah. same exercise or the, no, the, yeah. uh, the same activity, but either different contexts or just updated data. So I think that was one of the, in one of the presentations, if I remember, huh? I think only you, you had other data, right? So, or um, I'm thinking that um, for the, the next year, project, I think the students need to use at least one from the doing economics. But they also, if they want, they're also free to choose other data set. But I believe that the techniques they learned from the doing economics, for example, how to calculate the average, how to do some statistics, this can be easily applied to another data set. I think technique is essential. Yeah, just apply to this uh, different data set. Yeah. Great, okay, well let's leave it there and break for coffee. Thanks again to all the presenters. <laughs>